Good afternoon. Today we have um, another meeting of the Analytical Club. The topic of today's meeting is what kind of have in the future. Also, would like to remind you that this meeting is international and we have a simultaneous interpretation available. If it's better for you to it's more convenient for you to listen to what speakers are saying in English, please. Select the English track. Всех наших спикеров прошу в связи с этим не торопиться и помнить о том, что у нас есть синхронный перевод, не ускоряться. I would like to ask our speakers to not hurry, not speak too fast, because of uh, the interpretation. Also, I would like to remind you that our meeting is being recorded and the chat has, chat and has uh, rules are still that so if you would like something to be taken out of the final recording please let us know we will all, we will press pause and uh, we will not record your remark i would like to introduce our speakers andrei gorov political scientist senior analyst at the center for european transformation Hello, Andrei. Andrei is with us, yes. Anton Radnenkov, Press Secretary of the Coordination Council, Director of the Center for New Ideas. Hello. Anna Kozlova, who is a TEDx Minsk licensee and popular rise of science. Hello, Anna. Hello. And uh, Yaroslav Bekish, who is an entrepreneur and a graduate of the International Leadership Program of Senator, Senator John McCain, ex-head of the yeah. Queen Network. Uh, my moderators today are Valeria Kostyugova. Co-moderators are Valeria Kostyugova. Hello, Valeria. Also, looks like Vadim Majek will also, also join us later. We'll start with the first question. We'll start with Andrei Gorov. The first question is, what will be the key peculiarities of the future new Belarus based on the foundation laid in 2020? Andrei, floor is yours. Not so long ago, I uh, was, became popular in Facebook, which has a very provocative name title that says nothing will change, where I wrote that basically Belarusian system does not require any radical reforms. And if the revolution wins, what happens then will not affect most of the uh, lives of the people. It will not bring either significant improvement in their well-being or the decrease in their well-being. Basically, 90% of the people will, doing this, will be doing the same thing as they do now working on the same enterprises, being in the same parts of the system, and so in the same tasks. Overall, this will not affect much the people, regular people, but what will change is the systemic rules, the rules of the system and rules of the game, which means uh, and boil down to Rule of law, как бы, um, rule of law that serves these rules. What we have now, based on the principle of uh, that we witness now, will change. The general character of the political system will change, which means that gradually it will lead to to a different social political system. 
радикальных режим. At first, there will be no radical reforms in, needed in Belarus, particularly if we talk about uh, some traditional period. And the, I see two stages. First is a traditional period, when we have a traditional government in place. Um, usually, they should work not less than a year, and when new election comes, and based on the new constitution, the power bodies will be elected. There will be uh, deeper reforms in place. So the, the, the first period, the traditional period, is when we need to dis solve uh, several important tasks, but without deep reforms. The first task is has to do with the uh, new uh, institutions and the replacement of the old institutions for, for the democratic institutions. And the second task is to transition justice mechanism launch, formation of some independent judicial bodies. There will be dealing particularly with the legality in the country and based on the economic situation now, the issue of the decisive measures, the sphere of economy will also be relevant. Well, they will probably not touch the issues connected with the systemic foundation. So there will be no switch from the social democratic system that we have in place to some radical models of governance. So the and, uh, chronologically the next systemic reforms that are to start after this transitional period and uh, when the political system stabilizes will be about the wider fields. Uh, two of them are important, the self-governance reforms and the educational reforms struck me as the most uh, uh, significant ones. Thank you. Yaroslav, uh, maybe we could continue with you. What would be the key features of the future New Belarus based on the foundation laid by 2020? Okay, question. I decided not to think what happens if it would be better to single out two aspects that uh, define what kind of Belarus we will not have in the future. And the first aspect is political culture in the wider sense and uh, the economic aspect. Uh, also in the wider sense. However, the current phase, political phase, I think, uh, based on the foundation made by 2020, the political culture will be changing further, by inertia at least, for quite a long time, starting from some regular things that we see every day. Just like Andre mentioned, the Local governance, sub governance reforms, and the cooperation on the, and, uh, of the local communities, meaning what they have a right for, what they can afford, how can they use the local resources, and adding with uh, international level, and the issues that uh, have to do with the, such things as. Uh, separation of powers, the guarantee of this separation. Basically, in terms of political culture, Belarus is totally different, not the one it was at the beginning of the August. And we want these changes to be more uh, reliable and easy to foresee because we see some shakings now. 
Uh, and political actors in this moving from side to side. If we create, manage to create the mechanism of public consensus, Belarus will be put on the rails of the more in terms of political model. Economically, Belarus will also change. And we can, of course, mention the black swans. And, but I want to highlight the following aspect. Many Belarusians uh, now hope that the regime will, will, not, will be defeated due to the text of the political factor. And here, uh, when we talk about the turn off the swift in Belarus, without COVID, without uh, revolution, I must say, by the beginning of 2020, Belarus understood that what, what that we see in front of us, what Bel uh, Europeans call the like green swan, is a global, unforeseeable economic factor that uh, could lead to a serious economic crisis. And uh, here I mean how strongly our economic partner, I mean Russia, after the uh, European Union, how serious they are about the economic structure. And while at the beginning of the 2020, we were trying to to stir the relevant bodies in the self in order for them to put these issues on the agenda, both public and professional. Now, after the, what happens, we don't have any people to talk about this, so we're heading towards this green swan at full blast. At full swing, and the people that uh, deal with it know what is what is waiting ahead of them, know what to do, but they cannot discuss it either with the government, which is illegitimate, or, be, or with the society, or with the opposition. So this issue is still on the agenda, and will, it will affect us in a strong way, without doubt. So, uh, COVID pandemic is making the matters worse. This the future of Belarus will be either very adept adaptive to the situation, or will suffer uh, a big economic loss. These two factors uh, affect each other, and they're both affected by the factor of time. The quicker we manage to start working on this issue, the easier for us to be it will be to uh, survive the future crisis global and national. Vadim, are you with us? I'd like to say a few words. As I would like to continue. Thank you, Anton. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry to have joined you later. I was held at the interview. As I understand, Andrea Gorov and Yaroslav Bekesh have already express their views on the key peculiarities of the future Belarus, key features of the future Belarus. I would like to ask Anna Kozlova to continue and to tell us what will affect the situation in the future. Hello, thank you. I have been observing what happened in Belarus for a long time in terms of of what is forming the local communities because I'm one of the organizers of the TEDx Belarus. This is the point of view I'm used to. 
And what I saw at the beginning of the coronavirus crisis is the, the jump in the formation of the true local communities and true civil society. This is uh, uh, impressive how easily they cope with the tasks. We all saw what happened at the, during the start of the pandemic in the spring and how the crowdfunding campaigns and volunteer uh, teams helped uh, regular people and doctors. This continued into the summer and into the autumn. What I see now is a total ineffectiveness of the official institutions and agencies, be it the uh, healthcare institutions and first and foremost, the communication institutions. Consequently, we see the growing uh, influence of the informal institutions in this area. Over the last 12 months, many citizens of Belarus became much more uh, knowledgeable in legal issues because there were volunteer communities that were educating people in this area. Every regular person was told what we can do in this or that situation, what opportunities, rights and we have, what steps we can take. And this increase in the role of the volunteer communities in the communication in all directions, uh, I believe is the most important foundation because this is the system that is defective and doesn't have the proper feedback, doesn't give the proper feedback. I would like to uh, uh, speak as a biologist now. The feedbacks system is very important in nature. Every uh, living organism is receiving this feedback from the um, organs. From the, and if this feedback connection breaks, we, the organism starts reacting in the wrong way to what is happening. It's exactly what we're witnessing in the current Belarus, official Belarus. About, if we talk about the official statistics about the coronavirus cases, the fact that it's not available, it is the defective feedback. And this is true about everything. Is there a regular feedback in the area of education, the field of education? No, it's not there, unfortunately, because um, starting from the secondary school, the marks in the secondary school does not reflect the level of education of students and level of requirements of the schools of some weak spots that they have. This all accumulates. And going back to where, where I started, I see, and I'm very happy about what I'm seeing, how regular people have never done this professionally. I mean, some of them have. Uh, this is great. They're starting to self-organize to, to figure out how these defective systems are working and uh, feeling out the blank spots and the official agencies. Uh, to be honest, this is the most important thing, the most basic foundation of the future Belarus for me, because first it means the uh, replacement of ineffective systems with effective ones, but uh, not to be banal, it gives us hope irrespective of when the current political crisis finishes, irrespective of how it finishes, uh, the formation of local communities and the functions that they are fulfilling, for performing for themselves, is what stays with us forever. I hope that this will develop uh, and become even better. Uh, no matter how the current political crisis ends, this self governance and the readiness of the people to get involved in some urban economic social process, get involved into educational process, support of the healthcare system. This is all of what def will define our future. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I uh, was waiting for this biological approach uh, 
I uh, was happy to compare uh, that you compare it with a uh, living organism. Okay, last but not least, Anton Radnikov. What do you think, uh, as a person who particular uh, active part in political process, but also as a researcher, what do you think about the key features of the future Belarus? Thank you, Vadim. I'll probably uh, uh, echo the, what Anna said, but uh, I'll take a few steps back. We spoke earlier that Belarusian state failed to build the understandable state ideology. They failed to propose the image of the future country. Uh, this was evident in 2015. And since then, it was clear that Lukashenko was not able to show where the country was heading so, and the format of this future country. In this case, the civil society created a, an image for itself. So we can see what people call it. People call it New Belarus. This is the term that appeared and got spread this year. I saw it for the first time when Valerit Tsipkala said he would be running for elections. Uh, for presidency, he said uh, he published a manifest of, of Belarus. And since the spring of 2020, this notion became spread, has been spreading. When people say what they're fighting for, they're saying they're fighting for new Belarus. It means that people have a new image in mind, which they call the new Belarus. We don't know exactly what this image consists of, but uh, people think they have one single image in mind. Before that, the civil society in Belarus had a different vision. It was called IT country. Now we see that the new Belarus is a bigger than that. And the IT element is just a part of the new Belarus and the new image. Thus, whether the new Belarus will be similar to old one, I think in some cases it will not. But another point is that, another question is how fast the state and uh, the citizens started building the agencies in parallel horizontally, uh, uh, the local communities and the local chats, but also the vertical construction is observed. The quasi-professional communities are also evolved, like the sportsmen have created their own association, culturologists have united into their own associations, and the uh, same is true about doctors. We see now that the Lukashenko is arguing with what they, what they write in the telegram chat of the independent doctors. So if they had their own the white no. coats will probably remain and you healthcare minister will have to hold talks with this community because it represents a big part of the professional community. And the new mayor of Minsk appears, they will have to establish connections with the wider network of the local chats that also operate. Uh, Are they in their turn to also to create their own data. local leaders that be running the local elections? So these institutions will start to give some results. Obviously, this is a significant change. That's why I believe they will develop in, in an interesting way. And the speed of this in a massive nature is astonishing. The platform will remain, uh, but will perform different functions. It's good that people are not fighting against the regime. The people don't want to break something like educational system or something else. At the same time, the Belarusian community is uh, building in parallel their own institutions that are performing the function that they want. Of course, it started with the coronavirus, uh, probably started even earlier, and with volunteer 
movement developing, we saw a huge increase in that. Herbivores is winter, and it's clearly not the period when the mass relish is the best way of demonstrating your position. Uh, thus, this uh, digitalization will be deepening and in increasing. And probably next spring, these connections will be growing. By spring, they will grow even further. That, in a nutshell. Thank you, Anton. Indeed, uh, we describe what we can be called a proto trade unions or structures that precede the true trade unions, are things that we hope will remain with us in the future. I would like to move to the second question and to think about the main challenges because uh, with all the factors in place, we understand that the future Belarus will face the new challenges, be it the global, regional challenges or the factors that can be called uh, uh, growth factors. What do you think will be the main challenges for the future in Belarus? And what will help to achieve success? And maybe Belarus society has some factors that are very similar to biological organisms, be it uh, immunity effect, so something similar, something that will help us become successful despite all these challenges. I think we should continue the same order as we started. Andrei, the floor is yours. Thank you. I don't really share the optimism of uh, my colleagues because any uh, public upheaval can be uh, ended up with the um, community fall. And what we see now in this upheaval of professional, local communities, it's very important. But uh, as of today, I don't see any uh, reliable preconditions for everything to change forever, not and not coming back. The processes of development of these communities and self-organizing the people, they are reversible and then they can be suppressed because now we see the situation in the like, competition and struggle. Well, it would be great if it continues, then we'll be able to build something on this foundation. It's a natural foundation for growth or creation of new structures, new alternative foundations for developments in various fields of our life. But this is not uh, what happens uh, automatically. It has to do with the energy of the people, their efforts, and their understanding of the processes and their hopes for the changes, and so on. This is my first remark. And the secondly, in Belarus, we have uh, two approaches, and two of them, both of them are wrong, I think. The first is that everything in Belarus is wrong, that nothing works. Education doesn't work, healthcare is uh, defective, uh, the same is true about the self-state governments. That's once, that's one, and secondly, and second, uh, some people believe that everything is fantastic, but uh, sometimes we uh, go through the phase of the growth crisis. I think the truth is somewhere in between, because the we observe the institutions that work, we have the educational system that works, diplomas are being issued, uh, and students are being accepted into university. And I think probably this education is not sad, uh, that bad, since it managed to create a generation of people that are uh, uh, forming this revolution today. So, of course, we can say the state 
an educational system did not foresee this. It was a, it's a byproduct of the system. But overall, the public educational system, it did create this generation capable of active revolutionary, revolutionary and evolutionary movement, which means that the system, in a sense, is working and the reform cannot boil down to change, make everything from scratch. And the same is true everywhere. We have the local courtyard communities, but some people, they uh, support the infrastructure and all this does work. I mean, if you look at the other countries, uh, compared to them, our system works quite well which means that people are competent uh, people who do this uh, and the work ethic is fine so all this works of course we have some problems with the feedback rules some archaic norms of management some things need to be replaced a lot of things need to be changed in the country but the uniqueness of belarus today is that Unlike uh, 1990s, we do not require radical changes. What we need is uh, maintenance of the system, and we need to get rid of the system of the things that hinder the its development in various areas. Структуры нормально работающих институтов. Remove uh, this uh, ideology. And we need to restate the institutions that need, like courts, like legal institutions. And this will contribute to the great effect in the economy. And the challenges that we face are challenges that show that we cannot rely on everything to change automatically because. Today we see this solidarity and when we start changing the system, there will be uh, people who will be trying to go against this process. We need to overcome this struggle if we talk about uh, deep reforms than those in the traditional period. And of course, we'll have to face the global challenges that Yaroslav Pekish mentioned who said that this way or the other. We're facing the climate change challenges and the economic challenges. And since the European Union is trying to de-urbanize its economies and we had a problem with the SAM. Of course, these factors need to be and some things need to be solved fast. It needs to be done today. And being late with this, we're losing. The last point that I would like to concentrate on is that we will have to, at the new Belarus, to decide on the geopolitical strategy. Um, we have the Russian factor, the factor of Russia and the factor of our relations with the EU. This challenge of geopolitical orientation uh, needs to be solved. And it's not uh, uh, such a banal thing, but none of the existing strategies today is suitable for that. So we cannot simply uh, the, the agreements that ties with Russia, be it the Eurasian Economic Union, or the union with Russia, I just take the path that the countries took that uh, signed the association agreement with the EU for a number of reasons. We cannot do this. Consequently, we need to find a certain balance of this option. First, we need to agree with Russia and uh, negotiate with Russia a new configuration of relations that would guarantee the basic uh, things that Russia has here. On the other hand, uh, we need to deepen our relationship with the EU, but uh, 
without breaking the our agreement with Russia. Basically, this could be something similar to what Armenia signed recently with the European Union. Some sort of a compromise between what the, the countries with association agreement have and what we have. Thank you, Andrei. Yaroslav will continue talking about uh, global challenges. You spoke about them. Now we'll let's look at the uh, specificity of Belarus. Are there any things that can help us overcome those challenges? I uh, would like to start with something else. I heard about what my colleague said. And I would like to state that I'm an, an, an opponent, opponent to what Andrei and Anton said, and continue saying that there is a reason to be optimistic and proud, but uh, there are many more factors of risk. And here I mean that there are some things that we have discussed, like a vision of a Belarus that will not make itself happen. I agree with the colleagues that all the elements necessary for it are in place. If we look at its terms of structure, they either develop or they have appeared, we have the local conventions. They uh, used to be there, yeah, they were there before, but now they're flourishing. We uh, they have the expert community development, we have the connections with Western political agents improving. All this is happening, but the system requires not only elements, but also the connection between the elements and these connections. And this is my subjective view. I think these connections not only not being created, but also the focus has been shifted from one element, element to the other. I'll give you an example. Technically, I believe that never has, those has never been uh, created as an IT country like a, basically meetings and work with IT freelancers. It's not about the general IT group. What the goal is of the voice platform shows is was the first attempt to create like an IT approach. But this is the first, uh, okay, the first attempt. But those tasks are synchronized with uh, other important elements of the system that uh, we call the new Belarus. For example, the expert element. What are you, Vadim, are asking me about in the area of the corner of me, energy, legal reform, education, etc. Expert development in Belarus in all areas except maybe energy sector uh, due to the recent launch of NPP. There are a young specialist who do this not so long ago. You probably remember that there was a competition in all regions announced and each uh, expert group had their own developments like their own works that they prepared for this competition what could be done with all this all these, those riches the communication of the existing regime was imp impossible to establish there was no demand for this expertise. But people have prepared a lot of materials and have done a lot. 
Но у нас есть зато технические платформы голоса со всеми ее сателлитными проектами. Международные отношения, я имею в виду сейчас политические, в основном западные, тоже ведутся достаточно спорадически, я бы сказал. Сегодня я прочитал хорошую новость про Валерия Ковалевского. Я знаю, что это очень интересно. Но тоже, как его возможная работа, я ему сейчас совершенно не завидую, But может сочетаться с тем, что он человек делает для этого. И если бы мы могли выделить там какое-то количество важнейших элементов системы, начиная от международного сообщества, собственно, от коммерческого сектора, международные финансовые сектор, институты, которые готовы быть партнерами, will be happy to uh, make просто международные политические игроки, экспертные комьюнити, uh, вот, uh, uh, проекты. Да? Здесь не хватает только профсоюзов, like промышленных. Uh, в общем, это все потенциальные партнеры для строительства новой Беларуси, которые пока не появились, которые не появились, которые не появились. And uh, here, I believe, but I, we should be skeptical about we have partners, but we don't have partnerships. And I'm skeptical about uh, how we can build this new Belarus. If we talk about the global challenges and the system of global partnership, we're just ignoring global challenges, there's nothing to do, they are very strong and they crush many economies, they're capable of crushing many economies of the world, and uh, our market, which is not, is not really diversified, as soon as Russia becomes all the EU rules, which has been amended, we are И все к этому идет, поэтому как только эти партнерские элементами as soon as this partnership connections between the new elements of the system are established, I would say yes. There is hope. So far, I see only a small possibility of this happening. Thank you, Yaroslav. Considering the fact that Anton Rodnikov will soon have to leave us for another important call. I would like to give floor to Anton. Could you also answer the second question about the challenges and the third one regarding the changes that we should be paid attention to in the state governance or the society? I'll say a few words uh, about what we heard before. before. I joined the campaign at the end of May, then the structure of the civil society consists of the by COVID and Google form of the Victor Babarika. That was all that we had at the time. Now, what we have now, of course, there were multiple things, but uh, now we see many more things. I totally agree that the, there will be major changes. There will be more energy, there will be less energy, more energized society and lessen to that society. But we have new practices in the culture. So like the new marches now and the protest. And a new is a new way to express for the Belarusians the dissatisfaction. Half a year ago it wasn't the case. Talking about the connections between the new communities. I say that as the person who knows more about the situation from the inside, I can say that the situation is quite, well, quite fine. We saw that the old initiatives usually cooperate very well. They support each other. Before that, uh, we didn't witness any big arguments in the opposition circles, which shows that where they have one people have one goal, and people understand that that it, it will be wrong to waste energy on something else. And thus, we do have such challenges. Talking about uh, uh, outside challenges and foreign challenges and uh, 
choosing the vector, I believe that the longer the crisis lasts, the more important it will become how the foreign actors behave, how the, say, the EU behaves, how Russia behaves, if some of them helps protests in a significant way, they will gain the sympathies of this protest. So I believe it will boil down to next step in this conflict that we can see now. Other challenge that we face is uh, what we will we do with the supporters of the Lukashenko regime, as our sociologist shows. It is a significant part of the society, about 20-30%, who are also Belarusians. Without them, Belarus is not complete. And I believe this, the fact that Belarusian protest intentionally becomes peaceful, is a very important quality that gives a chance uh, that we will uh, be able to uh, work this out in a positive way. Well, first step is that we show that we are more of us and we should be afraid of us. And another approach is when we show uh, our moral superiority and uh, our enemies become our friends. So mass protests will be so involved so many people that many people who voted for Lukashenko didn't vote for Tikhanovsky saw this violence and they switched sides. So they supported the side of the moral winner. If we continue uh, keeping this moral stance without trying to scare the, uh, the pro-Lukashenko supporters uh, and become inclusive, considering that we have uh, law enforcement bodies like Gubopik and others, and how people negatively uh, treat the state bodies, and, and this will be a challenge for us to be inclusive of this protest. Another challenge will be oh, how the big businesses will behave. Before that, in the past, we didn't have the, we didn't see the uh, big influence of the big businesses. If we look at what happened in Ukraine and in Russia, in Ukraine, and it will be important what uh, position will be taken by the big businesses. Just like in Ukraine, with the big business controls, economy and political sphere and media sphere in total. If it happens this way, then we'll have problems. If it will, the system will be more balanced. We'll have more chances in Belarus. Thus, I agree to what Yaroslav Andrei said. That we have, uh, there are a lot of questions that we might need to have answered to. As a person who have been part of this since spring, I must say I'm very optimistic. I believe that they have the biggest chance to win uh, for 26 years. But I'm just a young person. Maybe I don't remember some things that were in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. There was a question to the chat about what to do with the that part of the society that supports Lukashenko. We have a couple of minutes left. Maybe somebody would add something. We just spoke about the moral stance is a protest. But as to the building new Belarus, where People will have uh, their own, let's say Lukashenko will have uh, their own party or in the parliament. What will be the ways to deal with this challenge? Let's see what, let's look at the sociological side of this. So, years ago, three or four years ago, it was thought that if Mackay becomes new president, everybody will be helped. Let's say Mackay rumors. If we look at what we have now, we'll see that the former statesman, a former prime minister, and so on, they're not popular. But currently, 
it will be it will can change in the future but today the state the societies generates very quickly new leaders the european new spheres and these new spheres satisfy the society we don't see that the former uh, statesmen from officials being very popular with people so the longer this crisis remains the less chance they have to become popular political figures in the future while in the state apparatus in, involves the work of several thousands of people and we need to be very careful about this the coordination council created a special concept of peace of peaceful developments important that we move towards this reconciliation and not towards the illustration and towards the trials of course we need to carefully treat all the violence cases uh that we observe on a mass in those but we need to tread carefully thank you anton i believe in that uh, uh would like to you thank you okay and then I was leaving us for and now we'll go back to our order and Kozlova. go back to the question about the main challenge uh, what our biological organism so-called biological organism will have to sustain I just wanted to answer to Yaroslav that I don't see any contradiction between uh, his and my opinion. Just like Anton, I totally agree with all the challenges that we see, all the problems that could be singled out, but I'm very optimistic about the changes. I totally agree that the system requires not only the elements, but the, also the uh, the cooperation and the situation when the uh, actors are not cooperating is uh, wrong and since we seen some a lot of work that was done in the previous years not being used but personally i don't have the information that this is not happening on the contrary i see a lot of communication in this area and of course this communication can always be made more effective uh, some experts can be involved, more experts can be involved, but it brings us back to the first block that we discussed, uh, and that I mentioned that one of the basic problems and the basic changes is the changing in the communication regime, changes in the quality uh, of the communication we see now the, well, partially we uh, need to thank the appearance of messengers and telegram channels for that and also the development of independent media in the last several years greatly contributed to this and they are supporting the current agenda at the high level so i mean here not only the internal media but also some neighboring media some wonderful lithuanian telegram channels where people are collecting information about about what's happening in belarus and then translating this into english everyone to uh, observe i can recommend it to anyone consequently the solution of all problems involve such actors communication needs to continue out of the challenges that i support uh, i believe the most the critical ones are is the discord that we observe now we have the single goal it's clear universal uh, it's based on hum humanism uh, of human that the violence should not have place uh, 
towards the citizens and terrorism should not happen. What united everyone that allowed all the political crisis to become different in quality is uh, that the, the focus from voting from another candidate shifted to something else, uh, to a totally new paradigm. So it's like a paradigm shift. So when this common goal of creating a humane society, a humane country, stopping violence and terror, when this changes, when this breaks into smaller practical tasks, there may appear some discord among the actors that are involved in this process, like a split. What to do about the 20-30% of the people who do not support the change? I think the, the only solution to this and many other problems will be long lasting, but it will be so for a long time. The basic foundation in the, in the new Belarus is the possibility to understand the opinion of other people. It should be fine for us to understand that people may have different opinions, like plurality of opinions. Uh, in one of the courtyard chats, when the policeman came there and said, I voted for Lukashenko, you can kick me out and abuse me. But people in the chat said, why should we do that? Only based on your choice, electoral choice. No, you, you did vote. And as soon as you behave as a human being, as soon as your um, basic values are humane and they coincide with others, as long as you're not being aggressive, breaking the law, we're fine with you be having a different opinions. And I uh, give you a biological analogy. It can only work as collective immunity. When everyone in the society has a community, then everyone is fine with everyone else having other own, their own opinion. Only then it will work. Again, th this could be, be the basic values, the basic value. I see it the only, as the only strategy that can uh, solve this problem. Uh, thank you, Anna. It's an important part. Do you think it has to do with uh, Belarus intolerance or is Belarus intolerance a myth? Uh, and maybe it's a new embodiment. Uh, that appeared uh, due to the new political changes and developments. It's a very good question. I think Belarusian tolerance uh, is, is a bit is a different thing. It's like a, a soft, non-violent uh, changes. And soft, non-violent resistance. I spoke about this at the TEDx in Krakow. I uh, said that Belarus finally received self-identification that it must be proud of, and it must be an example to the rest of the world, this peaceful nonviolent protest, because people are united by the lack of energy, uh, a lack of aggression, and lack of not on, uh, not uh, united by not a single political motor, but they united by the uh, inadmissibility of terror and violence towards people. And the fact that Belarusian society has not been subject to any provocations and, uh, appeals to violence means that I'm very proud of these people. I think it's a great story, and this is a basic new ideology that we'll all be able to become part of. And of course, it was based on the current political developments. You remember when everything was just starting in Belarus, 
uh, were compared with my Armenian friend, the situation with the Armenian protest. And uh, he said that he was uh, for two months very proud to be Armenians. And, uh, but uh, of course, he, we said that we agreed that there were some uh, problems that they have, have to had to overcome, like a small minor details that break this unity. But I believe it's a great time to move to our next question and discuss maybe non-obvious changes in society and state governance that are important to pay attention to in order to ensure a better future for the new Belarus. Andrew mentioned many systems that work well in Belarus. On the one hand, we couldn't uh, uh, doubt the fact that we still have hot running water and uh, roads are being serviced, but uh, it's great that they do work those things. Well, it's great that they're not, the roads are not dirty, but those the things uh, required additional attention in order to implement new reforms. Maybe add something to this, to what is happening to the reforms that we have in mind. It's a very difficult question that you formulated because when we talk about non-obvious factors, if we can talk about them, they become obvious. It's impo impossible to talk about non-obvious factors. I mean, what uh, some things are obvious for you, not obvious for other people. Underestimated factors. Well, probably we don't talk much today about the the fact that the changes that we observe, they are not irreversible. If we, as I say, believe that revolution will win and uh, we move to a new regime and the current regime will cease to exist, it doesn't mean that we do not uh, brand the danger of getting new populist, a uh, new populist leaders. So it's a new challenge for us. Uh, the new election can bring to power the the popular person that is as populist as the current figure at the head of Belarus, and uh, no institutional mechanism will save us from this new authoritarian power. So the 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 more detrimental economic situation during the election will is the more chance the populism may come to power. So it's better for us that we win as soon as possible or prolong this transitional period when we not only prepare to the new election, new constitution, but also stabilize the situation in the country where people gain, gain more positive views about the future, and then they will be prone to voting for more rational people, more rational candidates, for more rational programs, and less prone to vote for in, impulsive candidates. This is one thing that we don't discuss enough today. And second point uh, that uh, comes to the surface from time to time. It is what to, what to do with the people who do not share uh, the democratic values that people uh, uh, support now. And we see the deepening split between different parts of the society because this prolonged political crisis leads to these groups becoming and having diametrically opposing views. So their views are more radicalized. And the later the changes come, the later the changes come, the more radical the contradictions will be. So this process of uh, dialogue 
between different parts of the society in Belarus will be a problem. Another factor here is that the resistance to transformation. As we, if we look at the history of reforms, both in Eastern Europe and now in neighboring states like Ukraine and Armenia that had revolution not too long ago, we see that a big part of the resistance structures uh, who resist to the changes that are believed to be uh, present in the new democratic state, the new economic developments and new structure and new legal structure. I would need to understand these factors, resistant, I need to uh, evaluate the changes and the challenges that we need that we face. Of course, we can be romantic about this, saying that the, the, the new community will be the foundation uh, of the self-governance, but the people who work with them now understand that the current state is uh, really far away from real self-governance. And the people who live in the local territories, I mean, these constituencies, where these communities are formed. They're not really capable now, no, co not competent at the time to have this power at the local level and um, use it in the properly. Just think that today at the level that we have, we give all this uh, self-governance or powers to like a small town in Belarus, like a Zhitkovich. Let's say Zhitkovich starting from tomorrow is the totally self-governing towns in their own budget, communal services and so on. And healthcare. So this is a radical change. So, so people are not ready for this, for this level of competence and level of self-organization. We need to treat this carefully, considering this resistant factors that exist now. Indeed, Andrei, uh, these risks are very important. The risk of new populism that many countries of the world are facing, including the countries that were considered the stable democracies, even they don't have immunity against this. And if we talk about the competences of local communities, it's uh, very important to think how they will be overcoming this. And it's important to understand who we compare them with. If we compare them with the competences of the local uh, statesmen and local officials, uh, well, it's not really. So if we compare local chats with the local councils, state councils, they probably not have the similar competences. But uh, the saying that the non-official uh, uh, chats uh, are people at the southern level as professional is, I think, is wrong. Yaroslav, what do you think? in the future will be the things that will be needed that are not mentioned properly today, that are not connected globally to the political reforms, uh, like uh, fair court and reforms of the uh, cross and borders, but things that will be important. Thank you for clarifying the question, because when I read it for the first time, I uh, didn't really understand it. What would be the official, fa official factor? I think the uh, most important uh, factor that is not so obvious now, but will become more and more obvious, is the potential of the sabotage. And I'll explain what I mean here. I have a lot of friends who are active 
and public uh, public leaders of the process of the transition to the new Belarus, and almost all of them. Like Maxim Znak, like uh, people who help the political prisoners, the law is still while uh, choosing a new method of bringing closer the future Belarus and agreeing that the current political regime is illegitimate. All these people at the same time cannot afford more often to sabotage uh, the bans and uh, permissions in many spheres. We see how it's happening and how it... for me, such a good example was the lecture in by Vladimir Matskevich in one of the court. And people gathered there and they were not ready to, leave, to hear it and not ready to the self-management uh, of government topic. They were just eager to hear the ways of transitioning to the new Belarus. And when they heard him speak, they said, how can we do this? We're not allowed to do this. Like the Germans uh, you know, did, did not allow for part, partisans to exist. I'm not um, favoring some violent methods of resistance, but uh, the big questions, you know, who uh, allowed you to gather here? Nobody did. And Belarusians I'm not really good at sabotaging some uh, bans. But some things are in the past. People already take to the streets easily and uh, join the marches. But there are a lot of, lot of bans and cultural taboos of Lukashism that Belarus still uh, cannot overcome. This is not, not obvious thing. Another thing that stopped being obvious but should not be underestimated is uh, remember the beginning of the 2020 or the end of the 2019, any topic. Greta Thunberg, okay. It resulted in uh, people who are in favor uh, against Lukashenko to kill each other, you know, Greta Thunberg. You know, this is a culture of agreement, like, like Anna mentioned. It's only appearing, but I'm, a, I'm afraid to believe that it has finally formed within six months. This is only the beginning of the journey. I remember in the one regional committees gave permission to build a church and this tore the society because some people said it's about the environment, others said it's about the God. And the third group said it's about the rule of law. Belarusians uh, were not really interested in this rule of law. They were using this values to orient themselves and hope that the new, like, uh, new things appear for them to based on this opinion. You know. but, we're sure that uh, uh, this thing should ну, not be underestimated. Uh, last thing, so, this is obvious to uh, some and not obvious for others. After the revolution, maybe this is not obvious. I believe we have a Belarusian bourgeois revolution, which is a classical revolution that uh, uh, took place in Europe a long time ago. There's always a fallback, like a... And I, I agree with my colleagues here. Sikorsky would say that the theory of the transit and the recoil uh, is... Uh, 
Абсолютно. Uh, if we win, and uh, we'll, we'll, be happy, uh, I'll, I'll be hoping for that. Even in this case, will uh, will not be guaranteed against this recoil or throwback. And we we need to get ready for this. Thank you. You spoke about uh, throwback and. Uh, I've uh, thought about the restoration of the Bourbons family. Agre I agree that uh, no matter where we get, there, there's a risk of throwback. Yaroslav, I also wanted to uh, comment on what you said about the cultural taboos or Lucasism. Can you give some important examples of this, these taboos? Because we spoke about the things that people managed to overcome, like taking to the streets uh, what was and uh, is considered illegal by the police. But what other cultural taboos of Lucasism are becoming are still relevant and what, uh, what we need to overcome? I think it's a, a very interesting quest for all of us. <laughs> Yesterday I went to the agency uh, to the that issues passports and I observed this funny communication between a line of people and a, uh, workers. And a cultural taboo is to require that the work of the body of the state agency is more effective. People will be complaining that uh, uh, people in the kindergarten they need to pick up and so on, but nobody will assume responsibility to propose and uh, will be even better to promote it. And the new uh, work of the state institutions even for a day. And the same is everywhere. Uh, this, this thing is observed everywhere. We don't have this feeling of ownership to the state institutions that belong to us and are paid for by us. Uh, consequently, we need to be able to use it as part of as ours. Of course, discussing how to better optimize their work. And these cultural taboos of Lucasism uh, not only by Lucas, but also everywhere they penetrate our cultural uh, life, our view on policemen, view on a politician. Know that three years ago I was researching this issue. What were the uh, words? That was in Belarus. A leader was a bad uh, word. A politician was a, like a bad word. It's also true about the new culture. We say that we need new leaders, not one. We need leadership, we need new politicians, not administrators, but politicians. We need true mayors and not heads of the executive committees. But the whole system is full of taboos. I think uh, it took me quite a long time to respond. I think it was great. Uh, I like this ownership of the state borders. On the one hand, I, I understand that there are analogies, but I don't feel this ownership uh, myself because I didn't really want to own this such a thing as uh, state bodies in terms of, you know, I don't like it at all. So I like it to be better and fight. It's easier to give an example of uh, law enforcement borders. It's difficult to feel that these people uh, are protecting my, me because they do totally opposite things now. Time is uh, um, we would like to listen to commentaries from other participants, so maybe some of our major speakers today would like to add something about the cultural taboos. Maybe Yaroslava, uh, uh, while well, Yaroslava was speaking, and I wanted to add something. I wanted to say the new cultural practices that we observe, they work very well with this ownership feeling. The fact that people are taken to the streets and mark the territory of the city as their own. They draw wonderful street art, they uh, use balloons, and this is part of the ownership mechanism. The territory that belongs to me, 
no longer ends where I live in my apartment. Courtyard is also the part of my space, the same is true about the city. So the paint in the cities means exactly this. People are pay, paying uh, much more attention to this one about this space. The problems that the communal services need to take care of that are not solved uh, now seen by everyone. I think it's a proper direction. And if we talk about the obvious, non-obvious factors, it's important to add here that um, the obvious things need to also to be discussed because they uh, become something that is not discussed and uh, all the obvious things need to be reminded us about. One of the examples of this is obvious thing that is totally distorted in the informational channels communication is that the uh, authority is not uh, equal to the state. And this official rhetoric says that uh, the actions of the people who take to the markets are uh, anti-state, which is wrong. The, they're against the current authority, but the authority does not equal the state. Another obvious thing that is important to be regularly discussed is that it's not enough to break the old institutions, it's important to build new ones. We can face a very serious legal default, which is more critical than economic default, but it's not enough to break the old system of law enforcement bodies, which uh, fail, but also important to make a new system to improve it. I also wanted to add that the young Belarusian society is only starting to discuss the new uh, alternative viewpoints and hasn't really understood that the uh, civil society is not a zero-sum game. It's, imp it's impossible to create conditions which are good for all and which is normal. It's not a zero-sum game in the sense that some people have uh, fewer possibilities to implement what they want. It doesn't mean that, that they received less uh, this as much as his opponent received. It's the only way to reach a balance. It's important to satisfy the requirements of uh, one single group. It's important to understand that not a single group can be violated in the right. Uh, because as we see in the uh, 20th century history, the, the group that was uh, violated against uh, whose rights were actually prejudiced and encroached on as the white males, you know. It's not in our interest to create a group with uh, infringed rights. Uh, so when uh, I agree that when somebody calls me and said, I would like to, we would like to get an expert just like you, but a, a female and feel that something's wrong. Okay, let's um, move to the people who would like to ask questions or comment on something. I see some questions in the chat. I see very active discussion ongoing in the chat. Maybe somebody has questions or commentaries uh, about what we're discussing now. I see two, Lena Anderson. 
please, you wanted to say something. Yes, uh, I will speak in English, so I will do it slowly so the interpreter can manage. Um, so I'm, I'm a, a friend, colleague of Vadim. Uh, we were together in the Swedish Institute programs for uh, civil society and public sector sustainable management. We had a meeting just with the Swedish Institute, all the universities um, last week. And one of the topics we were discussing was how to deal with Belarus. <laughs> uh, because, you know, there is this, of course, ban, uh, boycott, sanctions, uh, which the Swedish government has, and it makes it really, really difficult to work. So the conclusion was that we could, uh, we could work with civil society, uh, but we cannot work with the public officials. So uh, unless we can get uh, funding from them on our own. So maybe we can do uh, some sort of, if we, for instance, want to work with the municipalities or with academia, or let's say with some sort of development of consultative processes in the process of restarting uh, another type of public administration and governance, then we need to raise that funds on our own to pay for people to, to come to Sweden and do things. So I'm here to ask for your input because we have now also got information today in a seminar with Swedish Institute that they want to increase their funding for supporting collaboration in the Baltic region. And there we have Belarus as one potential country together with Lithuania and Poland and so on. So if we want to do, and we are really, we really hear from Malmö University, and I think all universities are thinking, how can we do small, maybe grassroots projects? What shall we start with? And I really agree with what Anna said, that it needs to be, it's not only what you do, it's how you do it. So, you know, to really, to have a consultative inclusive process is I think extremely important, probably more important than what it comes out in the end, because it's all about trust building. So, you know, I'm just opening this question. Vadim has my contact. We have, uh, we have possibilities, we want to assist, but we want to do it the right way. So this was just a, a question mm -hmm. to the audience. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Lena. And uh, it's a very good uh, question. Talking about the Swedish Institute that uh, Lena mentioned, we see that uh, the wave of international uh, attention which is unprecedented for the new uh, history of Belarus. It's important to think what actions uh, can this result in that would be useful for successful transformations for future Belarus. Because obviously we see now the attention is focused in different way on different things. And I believe uh, it's a good question to all the speakers. Uh, what, how do you see the best way how to use this international attention? Anna Yaroslav Andrei, who's ready to comment on this? Together with Andrei, we are discussing this topic in International assistance manifests so differently. So I'll probably start and then uh, you can criticize me later. International assistance implements the Belarus constantly criticized by different structures, including the third sector structures. I separate the third sector and the civil society. The criticism is based on the fact that this assistance, including the Swedish assistance, is based on sinusoid approach. Some uh, support the development of infrastructure and actively support uh, cooperate with the uh, uh, 
Хорошо бы еще гражданское общество и свободу слова поддержать и права человека. Говорит, конечно, у нас же все есть. Смотрите, люди города. Вот им дайте деньги, и они поддержат нам свободу слова, гражданское общество. И международные менторы, и прекрасно понимают, что это подставные люди. Идут на поводу и реализуют дальше технические большие проекты с небольшим таким... Вишенкой на торте в виде поддержки гражданского общества и будущего. Вторая крайность, и такой пример был после 2010 года, я думаю, у нас сейчас будет, я прямо написал даже об этом эссе еще в конце августа. Вторая крайность, это когда Беларусь встречается в политическое, как было в 2010 году, когда после некоторой паузы, потому что политики в отношении Беларуси, видение даже в отношении Беларуси, у Because the vision towards Belarus of Western partners is non-existent. So at first was a shock, the, then a wave of the deep concern, and then the, uh, came the financial assistance. The same approach is evident. So the first approach, the relations with the institutions, and then decided to give money to non-state actors. Without conditions, saying that they are bad, you are good, and they will give you money. Nobody usually pays attention to the fact that the institutions of the civil society had been destroyed before that, or almost non-existent, although there are two NGOs, and this money is used методами командной экономики. Uh, Сказано выделить 20 миллионов, выделяем 20 миллионов, давайте экономии. быстренько, вот say, give them 20 миллионов, 20 миллионов is allocated. И есть второй неочевидный аспект этой проблемы. And the second non-obvious aspect is also present. The Swedish partners and organizations that work в регионе Восточной Европы, in the region of the Europe, в том числе в Беларуси, including Eastern partnership countries and Belarus, have another fluctuation. They are they behave better than anyone else. And supporting the Belarusian factors in developing their own strategy without imposing their view on the goals the strategy must have and the methods. Just simply helping to define the logic nature. Страховочные механизмы на случай риска скатываются в полную противоположность к худшим практикам, так делают все научные организации тоже, и начинают оценочные суждения, а потом еще и как бы прямо диктовать независимым организациям, консорциумам, акторам, как должна выглядеть их стратегия, исходя из позиций функционера тех организаций, которые распоряжаются деньгами. Of this organization that uses the money. Now, this is not about civil society. It's not about transformation. It's about making use of the budget. So the topic of international aid is very controversial. And it's easier to do harm here than to do good. I'm, I'm happy that all the changes in the last three months, mostly, I knew that some, there were some different issues. I'm happy that they happened because Belarusians did it independently and they contributed their own time and money to this, and there was no significant intervention from them. Yeah, actors. This is very important, and this is what I wanted to mention and answer the question. This helps to build a trust between the citizens of Belarus and treat the issues of policy, politics and leadership in the proper way. Putting tags on people. 
как, как делать хорошо, потому что получало много про проблем, я, я согласен, что эти проблемы бывают. You spoke about the problems, and I agree that problems, uh, those problems uh, exist. But you have any ideas? Как ее исправить? Как сделать так, чтобы это было эффективно? How to improve the situation? Есть у меня ответ только как бы с ретроспективой в прошлое. Я имею в виду Uh, возвратном наклонении. Как было бы that... хорошо это сделать в 2015 и 2020? Как это сделать сейчас, когда поле так сильно изменилось? Я готов думать на ответ, я даже готов придумать ответ. Желательно делать это не в одиночку, но готового ответа у меня нет. С точки зрения метода, да, с точки зрения готового Of method, Слав, yes, I have the point of view ready-made approach. I don't have it. Thank you, Yaroslav. Does anyone have any more comments, commentary about this? Or do we move further? I would like to read a, a question from the chat. Калини силовый протест, то что, а кроме экономического краха у всей Украины, примусит структуры, у яких пануе культ, волокилы, геомаль, криминальная психология, по делу всех на элиту фраеров, яких можно бить, гвалтовать и рабовать, перейти на больше моральный бог. That what will force them to become more moral in their approaches, if not force? That's the major question. Um, so who's ready to answer this question? Because it's a global question in nature very important. Does anyone have any ideas? Нет, пока вижу так. Виталий Нестеренко, по-моему, поднимает руку. Виталий Нестеренко, да? I think he's raising hand. Please turn on your mic. No, Виталий Нестеренко. Звучит довольно по-разному. Так, ну Виталий что-то не принес с микрофоном, кажется, потому что пока мы не слышим Виталия. Something is wrong with Vitaly's mic. We still cannot hear him. С микрофоном. Так, Андрей Егоров говорит, что мы будем находить. Андрей, да, тоже спасибо. Андрей Егоров is living the discussion. Thank you, Андрей, for your contribution. Виталий's mic. Да, Виталий, вот сейчас слышно, да. Слышно. Значит, я являюсь проректором Минского инновационного университета, чтобы так представиться. As to the questions that were asked earlier, I would like to comment on them and to look at the case using the information of what happened in Ukraine in 2012-2014. I would like to discuss the corruption in Belarus. As of today, if we consider corruption isn't distorted by some kickbacks, uh, and but the corruption globally is non-fulfillment um, by authorities of their uh, professional duties. If we take Ukraine now, or consider Ukraine then, why did Maidan happen? It happened because people, The Maidan was triggered by the non-signature uh, of the an affiliation no, with the EU, but also the actions of the Siloviki and the state apparatus were corruption. corruption. Three major points, things are used against corruption. The power method, the anti-corruption expertise, and the growth of public control. If we consider the today today's Belarus, after Maidan in 2014, 
in 2015, Belarusians uh, business uh, business and uh, business and big businesses in Belarus were pressured. Uh, this way, the state wanted to scare Belarusians against uh, protesting the way they did in Ukraine. Secondly, how Belarus situation is different from Ukraine. It is different in the sense that in Ukraine that law enforcement bodies was very much corrupt, much more corrupt than we have in Belarus. Today's Belarusian Siloviki is uh, not as corrupted. It is one of the few institutions that is performing their functions to protect people. Good or bad, it's another thing. But it doesn't allow for the system of governance to fall apart. What became the trigger in Belarus? It was uh, in August when a people before that, before August, did not pay much attention to the public control. Only the battery plant was the case when people were protested. So people saw the uh, they need to increase their public consci uh, legal consciousness and to know learn better and more about the state apparatus and how they perform their functions. Good example was the local cells that were created. And instead of reacting the adequately to this. The government, the, the authority decided to you remove the leaders of the protest, to squeeze them outside the country and to neutralize them. In this situation, the only method that could be used is to continue the educational activities among the population to show them the state institutions do not work properly and not to apply force as a protest. In this case, uh, the state will be playing their own field, you know, the, but if more people learn that this system is ineffective and cannot react to the existing uh, challenges, uh, we have a similar example of Singapore in the 1970s, which managed to un undergo the transformation process. Thank you, Vitaly. It's an interesting opinion, as I understand. Galia Nakashevsk wanted to say, to comment. Please focus on the future. Thank you, Vadim. I will not uh, speak less than everyone else. Uh, I was listening to you and remember the joke. Uh, but thank you, Anna, for the positive attitude. The thing that can save us today is only positive attitude. So when Yaroslav Andrei spoke, I wanted to go back into the past. And uh, when I think about the new Belarus, I imagine the, uh, see the yeah, young people, and I totally agree with Anna, who said that communication is uh, another level now. People help each other the show solidarity and the value level is totally new. Well, what will be the challenge in the future? And I'm here talking about the new Belarus. It will be to conquer the trust, to gain the trust of the democratic authorities, to gain the I mean, they need to gain the trust of the people, but currently the trust to the and to the, the authorities is not zero is uh, lower than that 
начинаешь думать. Правда, so это или... happening, Нет, это что касается выстраивания no власти. When I wrote uh, Yaroslav about the rebirth, and here I mean the renewal through the new generation. Our nation is getting older. And the number of people is decreasing. But we have witnessed urbanization. Like a new Belarus is a, like a more educated Belarus from the point of view uh, upbringing. Education field, of course, needs to be drastically changed because it's all full of ideology, but from the point of view of upbringing and new practices that we see uh, uh, with young people. This is very important. Yaroslav and everyone who represents the third sector, NGOs, uh, must know that this is, uh, was instilled the democratic practice of cooperation and communication. They spread even in the urban area and rural area. We have two millions of rural people living in the rural area and 7.5 million of people living in the urban area. So we have uh, urbanization, active urbanization. And I uh, know that the two more people, million people of under 19 and uh, so we see the new generation uh, growing up, but we have over 2 million people over six years old. Those are who support the old regime, the uh, surviving, you know, the using the practices uh, based on their fear, and uh, living on a single pension, and they're afraid of losing the money that they have. So basically, they leave, losing them. young people don't have this uh, fear. And people who take part in the marches and the protest, they don't have those, such problems. One more important challenge for me is the uh, renewal of the various powers and agencies because they work in there are uh, uh, particularly uh, the executive power and now we all witness the growth of the self-governing bodies and the chairs of the our pensioners who used to work in this or that structure and they we, we have the law and the alona must be observed. Therefore, the self-governing bodies have all that generation at the head. The people in the chat, the young generation, very much interested in the legislation. Uh, young people are much, uh, savvy. Uh, they're trying to assume the new functions of self governance at the local level. This cannot be changed. So I'm very optimistic about the future. Of course, I would, I, uh, would like to agree to celebrate the new year and the new Belarus. Uh, so I believe the positive attitude is very important. The attitude is great foundation. So I believe that we must all conquer this. Otherwise, I don't think it can happen otherwise. But I see that this is a renewal of society. When I made the research on procurement, state procurement, the ambassador of Finland was present at the procurement research. And he was asked, uh, in, the, in the past, uh, Finland was an agricultural 
agricultural country. How did you manage to become um, now to become one of the economically very developed countries, one of the leader countries of the Europe? And the best said, it was, I think it's 2017, he said, this year we're celebrating 100 years of our independence. It was in 2017. But in fact, we are celebrating 200 years of our independence because 100 years, 100 years, we was we were a very powerful autonomy. Then he said, I, please note that all the developed economically developed countries, including the United States and European countries, are mm, Protestant countries like Lutherans, Calvinists. Protestants, uh, and here the issue, not only the denomination, the, uh, so it's important what people have in their heart, what they, the principles they live by, and the Soviet generation did not think much about the values because they were uh, afraid, afraid of the Stalinist time and so on. Well, course, let's not go that, that far away in the past. It's very important, Vadim. Now it's all different. The old generation, our Saturdays, it's uh, leaving us, and the younger generation is uh, absorbing the democratic values. And uh, I'm uh, Спасибо. Therefore, I'm Спасибо. very much enthusiastic about the Belarus appearance soon. Colin, thank you very much. The Protestant ethic is a very deep topic, a wide topic that we can discuss. But, you know, in Belarus, there are a lot of Protestants and Calvinists. Religious discussion is uh, not, we're here, not what we're here for today. Anton... Are there any more people who wanted to comment? Or should we uh, finalize our discussion? Okay, let's finalize our discussion. We have uh, five more minutes left. And uh, I would like Anna and uh, Yaroslav, since Anton and Andrei have left us, could you please uh, say a few things about the future, kind of thoughts? Because we, I believe we had a very interesting exchange of opinions. And a lot of interesting points were discussed today. And Yaroslav, who wants to, who's ready? We have several minutes to finalize the discussion. Okay, uh, I will give you the floor. Thank you. The thoughts that I had during today's discussion is as follows. Before the revolution, we had a lot of change strategies. I, they were industrial strategies, the roadmaps, or didn't have any enthusiasm. Now we have plenty of enthusiasm. But we don't have the single strategy. If I have something to hope for in the near future, it is that we will manage to together to come up with a strategy and until we lose the enthusiasm. That's it. Thank you, Yaroslav. No, no, please. Unfortunately, I don't have a strategy. I either have a vision of how to develop certain fields. I can uh, say a lot about my future vision of a future Belarus in the education and the science, which is the two of my areas of expertise. But I know for sure that for the first time and the I feel myself as much Belarusian that until there are people who, as, as long as there are people who are ready to do something, or willing to do something, I'll be happy to join them with all my strategies 
and potential because I have uh, opportunity to return to Belarus and do what is, I believe is right there. I'm not particularly economically dependent on what is happening in Belarus and this is a privilege of mine. And I believe we have all the chances to conquer it, to overcome the barriers. There's a huge number of changes that are connected with the belief in the future and tomorrow. They're based on the people's belief that uh, we need a little more to win. And if this belief dissipates, we will no longer have a vision and process. But as soon as this is supported, as soon as this, as long as we talk about the future, as long as we plan the future, and don't limit us ourselves to judge in the past, I think we will succeed. Thank you. After such words about the importance of the future, I don't think what else to add to our discussion. I'd like to thank all the people who took part in our discussion about the future. I mean, when we were planning the work, we understand why we're discussing the current agenda. But we wanted to think about the future today, future transformation, the future challenges. I think we succeeded. I would like to thank everyone for this discussion. I believe the Expert Analytical Club will meet at least once before the new year. We'll conclude 2020, closer to the Christmas time. We'll send you all the announcements. Thank you.